Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Burke. I am the uh, Chief Marketing Officer at um, uh, DZS, and I am also a member of the Marketing Committee at Apple Land, and we are here today to uh, uh, walk you through a pretty exciting, uh, uh, I believe it's going to be a pretty exciting um, webinar today, which is uh, exploring healthy buildings and passive optical land in the times of COVID. Um, you know, we're all uh, both uh, as, as a globe participating in this uh, in this challenging time related to uh, the virus that's uh, running around the world. But at the same time, life uh, continues to go on. And uh, certainly there are ways that technology can not only assist in this um, uh, in helping us to uh, get through this time, but also uh, we can today perhaps even lay the foundations for making sure that when we come out of this time, we uh, we actually have infrastructure in place that will allow us to uh, uh, to not only accommodate what the, the new future may hold, but also put us in a position and put our businesses in a position to basically benefit uh, in the future. Um, I have a very uh, esteemed and um, and uh, you know, great panel uh, assembled today that I'd like to introduce to you all now. And um, I think that overall this, uh, I'm looking forward to really uh, exceptional day today. So why don't we do this? Um, why don't I uh, walk through each and every one of the panelists and uh, and have them share a little bit about themselves with you. So again, my name is Jeff Burke. I'll be moderating for most of the day today, doing a little bit of content, but uh, mostly walking through uh, individual uh, questions as well as uh, feedback from um, uh, the panelists themselves. Why don't we start uh, just uh, from an introduction standpoint with you, Julie. Um, we have Julie Kunstler, uh, who's the principal analyst at Omdia. Julie, why don't you say hello and tell us a little bit about you. Hello, um, welcome everyone. As Jeff said, my name's Julie. I cover broadband access technologies, especially uh, passive optical LAN, passive optical networking PON, next gen PON, and have spent a good bit of time researching and interviewing and covering POL and its trends in the ecosystem around it. So thank you. All right, great. Um, in addition today, we have Thano Lambrinos. Thano is a VP of Smart Building Technology at Quadrail Property Group. You can just uh, introduce yourself really quickly, uh, Thano, and, and uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Quadrail. Oh, Thano, I, I can't hear you. Maybe we got you on, on mute here. Sure. Uh, there, now we can hear you. So then maybe it's me. I may I'm having a difficult time hearing you. Maybe let's uh I'm going to ask that I we move on to uh to Rich uh, Rich Lebonsky. He's uh enterprise sales manager at DZS. Uh, Rich, can you um uh, can you chime in and say hi? Sure. Good good morning everybody. Uh my name is Rich Lebonsky. I'm the regional sales director for enterprise sales for the eastern part of the US. Uh, I'm also a board member of Appalachian and uh, work on the membership committee and assist with the European committee. For the association. All right, and uh, Francois, maybe you can uh, introduce yourself. Francois I'm, is from DZS and uh, uh, sales engineering director. Exactly. So uh, I'm responsible for sales engineering, sales engineering in Canada, and I've been involved in a large number of passive passive optical LAN installations. All right, great. Well, I know that we were having a slight voice issue with Thano. I'm sure he'll be back um, uh, in a moment as well. And as you guys can tell, we actually uh, have a panelist here that is uh, is uh, in Brian Hansen from Enersys, who um, is uh, struggling to uh, actually get in today to the panel. Hopefully, we'll get him in here at some point and give him a chance to uh, to uh, introduce himself. But he has a very good reason for it, and that is. Uh, the fact that he actually called me yesterday from the hospital where his wife was uh, delivering. And uh, as of uh, yesterday, we have a new uh, baby Hansen here. So um, <clears throat> if he is an absolute champion, then uh, we will see him um, on this uh, on this webinar in a few minutes. But otherwise, 
I think we can uh, we can all be happy that even in this time of uh, of pandemics and everything else, that uh, life does spring anew. And uh, I would, uh, if he is listening here before he checks in, and congratulations to you, Brian, from all of us. Okay. So with uh, with that said, let's uh, let me kind of walk through the agenda here for a second in terms of um, what we plan to cover today. So overall, uh, we've walked through partially part of the introductions. Um, um, I think that uh, I'll be listening for Thanos' voice chiming in here when I, I see him uh, getting back in, uh, and uh, we'll we'll introduce him, have him introduce himself in a second. Um, a after that, uh, we're going to have Francois walk us through a bit of an, just an overview of making sure that everyone's up to speed on what uh, passive optical land technology is and a role and value it has in healthy buildings. Uh, following that, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some market trends, and uh, Julie will lead us through uh, a couple of aspects of uh, of that. And uh, after that, we'll jump directly into a panel discussion. I'll be uh, really soliciting both from, uh, well, from Julie, uh, from Thano, and as well as from Brian, uh, their perspectives as to uh, how, you know, COVID is, is, has affected their uh, uh, their individual um, companies and uh, and their views in the industry, and also how they view uh, passive optical land technology, really lending them the opportunity to not only address COVID in general, but of course, healthy buildings overall, and uh, and is setting them up for uh, for success going forward. We also are going to have a couple observations on uh, from the hospitality and healthcare industries that uh, we'll be sharing that our experiences that um, uh, that uh, both uh, uh, Rich and I have had with um, other companies that are dealing with uh, different verticals in this area. And at the end, we'd be happy to uh, answer questions for you. I would encourage the um, I would encourage the audience to uh, um, utilize the uh, Q and A um, interface on the um, uh, on the uh, control panel, and uh, if you have questions throughout the uh, throughout, and I'll keep an eye on that and uh, and uh, chime in and bring them to the um, panelists as we as we go forward. So, can you guys hear me now? oh yes, we can, Thano. So uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself really quickly? Wonderful. Hi. That guys, uh, my name is Daniel Lambrinos. I'm in digital innovation and smart technology at uh, Quadrille Property Group. We are an asset manager, a developer, um, and uh, property management company of approximately 40 million square feet across uh, Canada. Uh, manage uh, just north of 37 billion dollars worth of assets in Canada, but also globally, uh, asset classes of office, uh, industrial, retail, uh, and multifamily residential, as well as some other alternatives like data centers and student housing and uh, other areas that we're looking at getting into. My group focuses on uh, the digital strategy for the built environment. So essentially everything that goes into the buildings, uh, whether that is uh, networking and connectivity, uh, various building systems, systems to, to a series of uh, value outcomes uh, around lower income, uh, around uh, improving the user experience, reducing risk, um, and improving sustainability. Uh, and obviously, uh, now uh, more topical than ever is a pandemic response in the in the light of COVID. Happy to be here. Thanks, guys. <laughs> I'm glad we got uh, your your connection issues sorted out. Uh, fantastic. And I also see Brian has uh, has joined uh, from Enersys. Brian, are you? Uh, uh, I see you're still on mute, but um, I see you as part of the panelists. Uh, can you uh, can you chime in here real quick yet or no? Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, oh, great. Yeah. Quick quick introduction for you. Hey, congratulations. We haven't had the chance really to say it uh, live yet. Thank you, sir. Uh, I am Brian Hansen. I'm the director for Enterprise Solutions for Enersys. Uh, I also sit on the technology committee uh, within Apple Land. So, so Brian, I uh, I don't know if you saw. We have a picture that you sent me. Uh, did you uh, have you guys selected a name yet? Yes, we do have a name. Uh, it's uh, Hayes Scott Hansen. Fantastic! Wow, and everybody I assume is healthy and uh, and all. Healthy, happy. Um, we're we're actually doing the webinar via the uh, delivery room here because uh, we're not allowed to leave the the hospital room under COVID circumstances. So here we are. 
That is amazing. That is truly amazing. Well, this is a, a there you have it, folks. This is a real, real life uh, situation here where we're going to have smart building technology at its best. Okay. Um, I, I suppose we'll talk about that a little bit later, but I'm really glad you're able to join. So uh, with that, why don't we uh, go ahead and move forward, uh, Francois? Maybe you can start to take us through just a, a couple of your uh, introductory, introductory thoughts on passive optical land technology. And um, and where uh, and lay the foundation for the of the Q and A we'll have a little bit later. Thank, thank you, Jeff. So for those that are new to this uh, exciting technology, uh, let's quickly review the main components of a passive optical land network. So the core uh, component on the left side is called an optical line terminal, and it acts as the core optical switch for the whole building. So you only really need one or sometimes a pair of these protected uh, ONT. Uh, for the whole building and in some cases for the whole campus. From the OLT, single strand, single mode fiber is used between each port and an optical splitter that you see in the middle. The role of the optical splitter is simply a passive device that replicates the light coming in on two multiple ports going out. And finally, the device on the right is called the optical network terminal or ONT, and it converts the optical signal back to one or multiple Ethernet ports. So uh, the whole system really acts as one large logical building-wide Ethernet switch. So that leads to multiple advantages uh, when comparing this technology to a traditional uh, copper-based network. Not only do you get all the benefits that are listed on this page, but you also but you, you do so by saving precious OPEX and CAPEX project dollars for the overall solution. Okay, next chart. So we will talk a lot about uh, smart buildings in this webinar. So let's take a quick look at uh, what we mean by this. So as with the building itself, a smart building architecture is only as good as its foundation. So this begins by uh, the infrastructure on which some sensor and some control uh, devices can be installed. So next chart. All this can oh, really? be in, no problem. All this can be interlinked by a telecommunication network for which passive optical LAN is very beneficial, as we will illustrate in the next charts. So once that foundation is in place, we can then organize N devices into subsystems, which are uh, and these subsystems are connected to car control and data gathering databases. So when you then you can take advantage of that. In order to use uh, uh, to, 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 in order to use analytics tools, including artificial intelligence, which lead to the creation of innovative new services. So, click twice. So the, again, so the end result is that the tenant uh, well-being, including your health, is greatly improved. So we will we will hear for a lot of these exciting use cases from our panel participants later on. Mixture. So what makes passive optical land the optical, the optimal technology for smart building application? Well, the main, really the main benefit is that it's at the attractive capex and opex allow building owners to lay a network foundation at a cost point that allows their LP build, building business case to be viable. In the end, really it facilitates the adoption of smart building use cases. Sure. So incrementally, uh, it allows the network operation to be very agile in its operation. So let's compare the process of adding incremental Ethernet ports for a copper-based uh, network on the left side with a passive optical LAN network on the right side. A copper-based network it requires uh, the, the addition of new cable between the switch and new devices when you want to add new devices, which is really expensive and disruptive. On the passive optical LAN network on the right side, you can simply change the ONT. In this case, on the left side, you had an ONT with four ports. On the, on the right side, it was an ONT with eight ports. You can simply switch these ONT to higher capacity ONTs and be able to add new devices without adding new cables. So another benefit is reach. So with the traditional copper-based network, as you see on that chart, you're really, really, really just limited to 300 feet or 100 meters between the switch and each connected devices. 
with passive optical land, the reach is extended to more than 12 miles or 20 kilometers, which allows end devices like cameras, access point, to be installed virtually anywhere on the premise. Finally, one other obvious benefit is the ability to remotely manage these systems. Like one common aspect of each vendor is the space is the ability to control not just the whole building, but a large number of multiple locations from one easy to use single pane of glass. Not having to send technicians on site while maintaining services is a great benefit not only for the tenants, but also for the administrators of these networks. So now back to Jeff with this final introduction. Uh, hopefully, uh, you now have enough information on passive optical land and smart building uh, to understand what's, what's what what will be coming. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Francois. That was a great uh, great run through. So let's uh, let's now step into the overall panel discussion itself and maybe take a second to uh, to really talk about some of the market trends we see going on right now. Julie, I know that, um, you know, obviously you are a, a, a renowned expert, obviously, in, in the, all things passive optical land, but, uh, you know, there's there's a, a lot of things that are happening overall in the, uh, um, to the industry itself, some of which have been really impacted by the, uh, um, by the pandemic itself, and yet there seems to be a bit of a silver lining that's sitting around this for the folks that are part of this. Maybe you can chat about that for a second. I'm sorry, we need to unmute you, Julie. I, for some reason, you're still muted there. <laughs> Julie's self-muted. 2020 to be down a little bit in terms of uh, broadband access, but then we expect um, my most recent forecast, which came out a couple of weeks ago, shows a very strong rebound um, and, and much higher than the forecast that I had in February. So why is this? I think that there's Never before has broadband connection connectivity been so important, whether you're working from home, studying at home. But there's something else that I think is very important that we're going to see post-pandemic, and we're already beginning to see it now. Is that it's we're not in an e, we're not in an either-or situation. We're not in a situation where everyone goes back to work or everyone stays at home. We're basically seeing both where some people are back in the office environment or in the campus environment. Um, healthcare, you know, as we've seen from the panelists today, we're, we're still delivering babies, we're still undergoing surgeries, um, we're still holding conferences, while some people continue to work or study from home. So we need much higher bandwidth in both the home and in what I call quote unquote campus settings, whether that's hotels, conference centers, hospitals, um, enterprises, that's going to continue. And so we really need bandwidth in multiple environments at the same time. And as I've always said, even wireless data spends most of its life on a wireline network. So we're seeing uh, a tremendous demand for passive optical networking and in the campus setting optical LAN or POL. Well maybe Julie we should chat about that campus setting for a second because I know that um, this is one of those uh, areas that um, is was really fascinating to me when I saw some of your uh, research recently on uh, the different types of uh, applications as a service right uh, um, infrastructure platform uh, etc and uh, that those trends in and of themselves are actually the under Pinnings of uh, of a lot of this uh, this need, and this is of course uh, specifically focused on campuses. But of course, there's not that much difference between a campus and an en and all sorts of different enterprises that we'd be talking about in general. Correct. So this slide specifically looked at higher education, and I worked with our analysts who cover higher education applications as a vertical, the vertical industry folks at Amdia. And more and more universities are relying on cloud-based applications um, and infrastructure from the cloud. 
services from the cloud, et cetera, because it reduces their amount of spend on IT on the campus. But to be able to use cloud-based services, you need even higher bandwidth, and you specifically need symmetrical bandwidth. And I like to stress the importance of symmetrical bandwidth because many of us working from home have had that experience where the upstream has, has typically been an issue. Um, Pond solves that upstream problem quite nicely, but that upstream issue can also be the same bottleneck in the campus. So what this slide shows is how higher education is moving to cloud-based applications. It's driving tremendous bandwidth demand in higher education, whether it's universities or high schools or trade schools. One of the catalysts that I've always seen around passive optical LAN is bandwidth. It's, there's really two, two main, in my opinion, underlying drivers, and one of them is simply bandwidth. And this just proves that as you move to cloud-based applications, which also saves, as I said, tremendous IT expense, you have to have the bandwidth behind it, and it's POL is really the answer here. So, Julie, um, in general, though, I know that this specific slide uh, was pulled together for uh, for higher education campuses, but I, I assume you're of the opinion that these same underpinnings really are uh, are are uh, you know applicable across all the different types of verticals, from hospitality to uh, uh, to events, right, to um, uh, to uh, you know, office buildings, et cetera, right? Oh, it, it, absolutely. You know, this was just a this was just an easy one to uh, to to show where you can really see the significant um, increase for sure. And then add on top of that the impact of COVID nineteen, and that's basically how do you keep your employees safer? How do you keep your customers safer? And that requires some very superb smart building analytics which are heavily cloud-based because that's where you're going to have keep your analytics are in the cloud so you have yet another bandwidth driver because of because of our pandemic so smart buildings take on a new meaning or an additional meaning an additional requirement in the pandemic um, and i and i'm sure we're going to get into that on this panel in, in a lot of detail Absolutely. Well, given that, maybe uh, I would like to talk to Thano um, from Quad Real about uh, his experiences there. I think we've um, he's uh, dropped his video, but are you still there from a voice perspective, Thano? I am. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Well, you sound a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, you as as you mentioned are uh, are representative of. Uh, tens of millions of, of uh, square feet of office space. Maybe you could uh, kind of chat a little bit to us about what you've been seeing in the market since the rise of COVID, and maybe we can uh, go from there into uh, the applicability of uh, passive optical land. And, and I know you had this recent article you uh, written in uh, Realcom about establishing this digital foundation, which I think is really along the same lines of what uh, Julie was talking about, in that. Um, you know, uh, once the digital foundations is set for in these environments, that uh, you really have a lot more opportunity for uh, for basically delivering better services and and for you as a business, I mean, uh, basically uh, having a foundation for uh, serving those uh, those services. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the interesting thing that the pandemic uh, made us realize is that the requirement and and this isn't sh it shouldn't be new for anybody on the panel nor in the audience but the the requirement and our reliance on technology um, is is enormous and contrary to what we thought would happen or what we would expect would happen in the case of a, a major economic slowdown uh, where spending decreases and don't get me wrong it has in a number of areas um, the actual the the digital strategy that we have laid out or that we had laid out prior to uh, prior to COVID uh, has simply been accelerated. So COVID in fact is acting as a significant accelerant to a number of the uh, digital transformation strategies that we had already had planned for the built environments. What's also interesting is that none of the technology actually changed, just the use cases changed. So prior to COVID uh, 
kind of taking over the news cycles and all of our daily lives, uh, we had already planned uh, a significant deployment of connectivity uh, in this case, uh, or relevant to this, the passive optical technology uh, throughout our commercial portfolio with plans to uh, start implementing across other asset classes uh, across the country and, uh, and into our new developments uh, prior, prior to the pandemic hitting as our foundation for connectivity to realize a number of use cases that allow us to see outcomes like I talked about when I introduced myself um, to reduce costs, to improve operational efficiency, improve energy uh, consumption and promote sustainability uh, and improve the user experience, reduce risk a number, among a number of others. Uh, but what we found is that the requirement for this technology was, uh, was critical during this time. Uh, so we accelerated a lot of our deployments. Um, uh, some of the deployments that are supported by the, the PON technology uh, and, uh, and by LP WAN technology sitting on that PON technology uh, are things like uh, um, people counting and occupancy sensors. Originally, our intent was to deploy this so that we could get a general understanding of how our spaces were being used. Um, was our design in various different spaces appropriate? Uh, utilizing that, uh, those people counts to adjust HVAC systems uh, and lighting control systems for comfort and energy optimization and a number of other use cases. But, you know, we would have never thought that uh, that occupancy would be required to uh, promote social distancing, which is what we're focused on now. Um, environmental air quality is another major area where we uh, deployed a number of sensing devices uh, to get a sense of uh, health and wellness within the building. Uh, we, we're doing a lot around advanced filtration systems, all of which communicate back to building systems, which need to integrate with other systems, which um, communicate through the PON networks that we've been deploying across the country. Uh, so, so really, you know, COVID has been, as I mentioned, a, a massive accelerant to uh, to the strategies that we've already had in place. We're just using them slightly differently. Interesting. Well, uh, so. How is uh, passive optical LAN, uh, you know, playing into this whole uh, recipe from your perspective? I can, I, I hear that, uh, you know, you're you're finding lots of good applications for this strong digital foundation, right? But uh, what, what, why did you, uh, why did you look so closely at passive optical LAN as a technology to go and deliver this? In real estate, scalability is key, and cost. It obviously, you know, real estate is, as if you look at some of the studies done by McKinsey a couple of years ago around the digitization of various industries, real estate and construction in the built environment is very, very close to the bottom. In fact, the last study in, I think, 2016, uh, it was second from the bottom of just above agriculture and farming, um, being eclipsed by pretty well every other uh, vertical market out there. Um, so, so as an industry, we're very slow to uh, to adopt new technologies, and one of the reasons that we are is because uh, in a lot of the cases when it comes to connectivity and smart integrated buildings, um, it was very difficult to make the business case, and it was very difficult to scale. So, the requirement of connectivity, as I mentioned in the article that you alluded to, is foundational. It's very, very difficult to realize any of these use cases or any of this value without having uh, secure, scalable connectivity. And in a traditional sense, as Francois alluded to, um, there are limitations to, to active, um, typical active ethernet networks, uh, the biggest being cost that prevented us from being able to deploy, uh, deploy across a, a large scale portfolio. So our, the, one of the major decision points was, was around cost. Um, in that the PON in, in the in the cost comparisons that we did, the PON technology came in at anywhere between uh, 40 and 70 percent cheaper from a, a capex perspective, but also uh, from an ongoing management perspective, uh, came in uh, 50 plus percent less expensive uh, to ensure that the operating cost for our tenants was significantly lower. Um, but over and above that was just the scalability and the flexibility of the technology and how conducive it is for, uh, for us to very easily um, add and expand systems as buildings uh, transform and as tenants move in and move out and as we undergo you know, series of renovations over, uh, over years and years of the, the building's life cycle, uh, to have that infrastructure in place to be, uh, 
to be cost effective and scalable is really paramount to the success of any of the technologies, the use cases that uh, the technologies that sit on top that ultimately uh, enable the use cases that really deliver value. Um, so, so you know, really, frankly, without the pawn technology uh, in the equation, you know, the smart building discussion gets gets halted and halted pretty significantly. And that's one of the other reasons we haven't really seen uh, significant uptake. A lot of rhetoric, a lot of investment, a lot of money flowing into prop tech, uh, but without this this very flexible, um, scalable, cost effective layer of connectivity it, as our foundation. Uh, it makes it uh, very, very difficult. So, so that's that's really the the a lot of the decision points that went into us choosing Pawn uh, and deploying so aggressively across our portfolio. Understood. Well, I thank you for that. That was a fantastic explanation. And you know, you spoke so much about costs here. It probably makes sense for us to to uh, talk to Brian for a second here. Um, Brian, uh, let's uh, take you off mute. Um, you know, you are uh, you are uh, from Enersys, which obviously is a company that's an expert in the <laughs> in the uh, in power consumption and things within uh, within uh, buildings of well of any of any sort, right? Maybe you could talk to us a little bit about uh, what you're seeing right now and some of the uh, use cases that are uh, coming across from um, uh, from Enersys's perspective. Well, I think Thana really hit it on the head. It's it, it's not that there's truly new use cases or new use case. It, it's the value of the use case, and, and there is growth to an existing use use case. Uh, I mean, healthy buildings, you know, have been around for some time. There's been a lot of discussion, a lot of articles, a lot of books, papers published on this. Uh, I mean, think of a casino. Uh, casino is a good uh, application where we have always promoted essentially that that healthy building and a lot of that is from airflow and a lot of that is you know that air quality that natural light that 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 freedom to move that's always been a place of a healthy building right 90 percent of our time is spent indoors right so obviously that has a lot to do with our performance our productivity and there is a correlation directly between the healthy building and those uh, when we look at use cases that Thano brought up, we'll take security as an example. It, it might have a new meaning today, uh, where security traditionally, uh, especially for those of us who have been involved in facility type builds um, over multiple verticals or markets, uh, right? You're looking at maybe from a physical standpoint, um, you know, maybe leveling a threat asset on something they're physically holding or potentially um, you know, facial recognition of that. Well, now security's moved into that position of what we see as infrared scanners, uh, potentially taking that temperature kiosk, uh, moving into touchless access control and the whole idea and theory behind the touchless building, right? And a lot of us now in, in COVID, you could admit, admittedly say that you maybe don't wanna to touch the elevator button. Maybe you don't wanna push um, uh, or touch a doorknob or push an exit bar uh, on a door um, because there might be some current concerns of that. Uh, you know, something that Julie also pointed to that, that we see very much on everyone's horizon is now you're talking about IoT. You're talking about that artificial intelligence, the algorithms that are going into this, um, you know, we, from a power standpoint, we like to always strike home, you know, remember virtually every electronic component is a DC power, right? It's, it's a DC circuit in some way, shape or form. IOT has been a key driver for us uh, in passive optical land, right? All the various devices that you could put over that optical network, um, whether it be local or whether we, you know, extend it further and say, you know, the GPON and PON networks that we've been deploying for decades. Uh, you know, you look at these IoT devices, now you're talking about sensors, as the Julie point, there, there's, there's cloud-based, but you're driving all this data. You're talking about infrared scans, uh, you're talking about crisis location, alerts. Uh, you know, they now also brought up another good point that we've been seeing uh, is heat mapping and thermal mapping of an actual complex of a building uh, of a campus to find out not just where uh, the trackable is from a from a security standpoint but now you're looking at potential costs of sterilization 
uh, cleaning crews that come in after hours to sterilize and make sure that you're having a safe environment, whether that be for workers or in this case where I'm at today um, in a hospital, right? You need to look at it from the standpoint of now we're looking to, to understand the, the, the theory behind the thermal mapping and now the AI behind that. Now we can start saying, well, no one entered this zone of this building. You don't need to sterilize the whole building. Uh, now we can just focus on where we've had movement, uh, where obviously people have been and where there's potential cause for the virus. So again, these use cases have all been here. Now we're adapting them differently. We're finding value in them differently. Uh, and that's all helping our advantage in relaying these costs in your TCO and your ROI. Well, Brian, let's uh, relate that to um, to Pond in particular. I think that um, you know you uh, obviously as a uh, uh, someone who deals with um, uh, really power <laughs> almost exclusively in the use case you've seen. Can you compare and contrast what uh, what you see with uh, passive optical land as a technology versus other technologies you're seeing in buildings, and how uh, perhaps the the cost savings are uh, are a are applicable in that environment. I know that Thana was mentioning that uh, you know they they'd certainly seen some real advantages. Well, when you really start comparing apples to apples, and that's you've got to start looking at this um, not just from an from an IT group, uh, not just from one bucket, right? You want to bring all the buckets together, and you want to look at a complete facility. There's a lot of costs associated with that. Uh, when you start breaking it down into passive optical land. Uh, and, and strictly from a facility standpoint, especially when you start utilizing tools at your disposal. So one of the benefits is that, you know, you are modular in your design of passive optical land, and that's where we play very well on our end um, by, by really focusing on DC power and really focusing on remote line power. You have a higher level of efficiency with DC power than you would with traditional AC power. Um, that being said, when you are eliminating um, and, and building a, a future-proof building from a fiber side, you also want to consider your asset as a power, right? Your power asset and that infrastructure to provide power to these locations as we start seeing more IoT devices that all can be applied and added to this passive optical land, we can future-proof uh, our notes. We can provide the, the power required from that ONT to really start adding these devices at a rapid rate. Um, and that's really what we're seeing from everything from, you know, potential use case for robots, um, the IoT centers, um, you know, sensors, RFID, uh, all these new wearable trackables, um, you know, it's really all of these things are adding to that collective nature of, of public health, especially in this COVID era. Passive optical land gives you the future proof to be adding these devices, whether that potentially could be um, you know, a 5G radio, uh, whether that could potentially be, you know, a, a Wi-Fi 6 upgrade or even moving to a private LTE network where uh, the actual hospital that we're here, um, uh, give a, that we had our baby at, um, is, is a partner of ours that has moved from Wi-Fi to private LTE, and that's all over passive optical land. Uh, so the, the, the benefit of that future proof of fiber, and when you can build your power infrastructure and leverage that asset in the same way, um, you, you really start seeing from a facility standpoint um, that, that high end 60 to 70 percent uh, cost savings throughout the facility. I love the fact that not only do you uh, evangelize uh, passive optical land, but you, you actually live it and, uh, and uh, are actually interacting with us in <laughs> that sort of environment today. I wanted to take a second to um, perhaps introduce you to uh, just a case study that uh, that uh, uh, DZS had run into recently in uh, the hospitality sector. Uh, we actually have a uh, uh, partner and, and uh, of ours uh, named Nimbus Networks that works as a solutions integrator and has about a thousand different properties in the hospitality industry across the U.S. and Latin America. And um, you know, similar to what uh, Thana was talking about in laying that digital foundation, they, has, they have a standardized solution that they are delivering into you know, play, uh, hotels like Marriott's and NH and Starwoods and Hilton's, et cetera, in which uh, it's foundationally GPON with carrier class Wi-Fi throughout the buildings. 
user access management, interactive TV. But one of the most interesting things that they've been doing is contactless software. Uh, so to minimize physical contact as uh, as um, guests enter the uh, enter the hotel environment. And uh, this is just a, a bit of an example of uh, how they've been applying, you know, very flexible infrastructure like uh, in these pond infrastructures to basically enable. I don't know if how many of the people on the line right now have actually had travel for business yet uh, during the uh, pandemic, but it's very disarming, right? To basically all of a sudden realize when you enter that hotel that used to spend, your, you know, maybe uh, half of your weekend almost every week that uh, this is now potentially a danger zone and you don't want to necessarily touch anything. And what Nimbus has basically been doing is uh, taking that, uh, that concept and turning it into uh, making it all available over your cell phone, right? And so not only uh, does when you walk in, does the the cell phone then becomes your contact device and as you know you kind of walk through the slide you connect with the key, uh, qr code the moment you uh, enter the hotel on that uh, on that device and from that point you can utilize your own device that you've been holding and touching and working with uh, and have you know are already <laughs> already within your 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 uh, trusted circle right for uh, full service menus within the hotel, you can get information about the hotel itself. Uh, you could basically browse the uh, the menu for ordering room service. Your phone actually becomes your TV remote control in that environment, right? Um, uh, you know, calls that are coming to your room, say for other from other rooms or from uh, uh, facilities, uh, you know, the front desk or something, will forward directly to your own uh, your own trusted phone, right? You can request amenities, you can chat and get assistance, like calling the front desk, obviously, uh, browse a gift shop, make your next reservation, and check out without ever having had to do anything but touch your head in the pillow. They, I've actually uh, was the environment I was in. I actually opened my door with my uh, with my phone as well, right? And so it's uh, it's pretty amazing the extent to which you can uh, take advantage of some of these services. And of course, Nimbus has uh, seen a, this opportunity of the pandemic to not only uh, very aggressively see uh, interest in, in taking up these services, but also with regard to uh, a lot of hotels who may be at a little bit of a lull right now in terms of their um, their uh, you know overall capacity. Um, actually utilize this opportunity to do these upgrades so that as uh, as things continue uh, to open up, they are ready not only to address challenges with the pandemic, but also have that di digital foundation upon which they can uh, uh, provide better services for their customers in the future. Um, you know, Rich, I wanted to uh, give you the chance uh, really quickly to kind of walk through uh, something I know that you've been uh, working with with one of uh, your customers in uh, in um, Healthcare. Maybe you could uh, kind of chime in and, and uh, tell us what you've uh, what you've been seeing. I believe you're on mute right now, just in, in case you weren't didn't realize it. <laughs> you went off and then you went back on it again. There we go. There we go. Thank, oh, you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's, for me, it's very interesting. Since uh, mid March, I've had the occasion to talk to uh, the CIOs of two healthcare systems that are actually very similar in size and, and scope of what they do. They both run multiple facilities. Um, they provide uh, a range of support services for senior living, everything from independent living to assisted living and, and critical skilled nursing. Um, and I, I wanted to understand sort of how COVID was impacting them and how they're sort of uh, uh, you know, innovating to solve some of these challenges. Um, many of the folks on this call probably know, you know, Arch Care in New York has been a passive optical land customer, a, you know, adopter, one of the earliest uh, for many years. Um, and uh, specifically, that you know, just echoes everything that the earlier panelists uh, mentioned. But patient isolation was really a severe challenge, and it limited um, how frequently the healthcare providers. Uh, visited the patients, how the family interacted with them, and uh, even the entertainment uh, that they had access to. Um, so, uh, so in Arch Care, they're already on Pond Network. They, they were drinking the Kool-Aid back in 2014. Um, so uh, one of the things that they had to do was uh, they increased their channel lineup for the video services they provided. That's really not 
uh, it, you know, it makes it easy and flexible to do over pond. Um, and as you see in this picture, they actually had mobile tablets that they brought along um, to uh, schedule FaceTime visits for their patients. And that was pretty innovative. And all that went over a pretty robust Wi-Fi network. Um, in contrast, the other organization that I spoke with, CIO, um, the, uh, we, can, we can jump forward for, for a bit. Um, uh, they did. They were um, not on a pond network. They had their older older facilities, um, and the COVID, uh, the isolation that COVID brought about, really um, enhanced the need for uh, better better Wi-Fi, more endpoints in their rooms. So they what they assessed was they needed to increase at a in this particular uh, scenario they had a hundred unit uh, hundred unit facility over three floors, so roughly 35 units per floor. They assessed that they needed to add four endpoints to each room, okay? Um, but one of the challenges that they had is it's a, it was the, just the physical topology of the building. It's hard ceiling. They don't have easy access to run additional cables. And that's what prompted them to, and they're still going through the evaluation process, to assess on because their alternative is to run four cat six cables you know for each room down the hallway and cover it in raceway of some sort um, which would be roughly 120 cables per floor and all the terminations in the closet or to, with gpon or passive optical land it's significantly reduced so that was sort of the the, the business driver uh, for, for their evaluation and so there you know the contrast is quite interesting you, you have one system one health facility that was already on pond, an early adopter of pond that you know adapted very easily, and that, and uh, another provider that is struggling to, to meet some of the challenges. The other thing, you know, this is sort of consistent. We've, if we've started to resume travel, you've probably uh, you know stood in front of one of these automated temperature uh, infrared readers. Uh, the the takeaway is that with in senior living and healthcare facilities, there's increased demand for more automated interaction. Um, so this is um, you know, more devices, uh, collecting more data, um, and minimizing human interaction. Um, and so, you know, that's, uh, as Thanos said, it's accelerating the adoption or the, or the, the, uh, the need to deploy these uh, smart building and healthy building solutions. Thank you, Rich. Um, you know, one of the things I, I uh, you know, want to get back to the um, the panel overall, and there's some, actually a number of questions that have been uh, that have been coming coming in the background. Uh, one of which is uh, actually uh, an interesting one. They, it was uh, um, well, they're all interesting. I, I apologize for that, but uh, they wanted to ask which which one was. Uh, given all these great things we're hearing about Pond, what are some of the disadvantages uh, that you have? Upon? Why haven't people done this yet? <laughs> Maybe I'll start with uh, with you, Thano, and uh, just with uh, your perspectives on that. Why why uh, why do you think uh, you know this is still kind of a, in, a technology that is in its early days of uh, of deployment, rather than one that's been uh, uh, even though Pond itself has been around for over you know obviously over a decade. Uh, why isn't it the predominant technology at this point in time? Well, I think there's a couple things, and uh, I'll preface this by saying that I'm by no means an expert on the technology. I know just enough to be dangerous. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but I think that there, there's been a lot of more recent advances in the uh, in-pond technology that makes it more applicable for applications as we looked at them uh, in built environments. Uh, so, so the, a lot of those those technology leaps that the tech that uh, the ponds made um, aren't uh, aren't maybe as well known or as well proven, and that's kind of the second point is the it, it's, and I'm speaking specifically to applications in real estate. Um, they're not pervasively deployed in the same way that um, that that some of the traditional um, active Ethernet manufacturer and, and networking manufacturing companies are deployed. And then, of course, there's market issues. Um, and but when I say market issues, I mean the fact that you know, in a lot of cases, these uh, these uh, networking, these traditional networking companies are 800 pound gorillas compared to the size of some of the pond, um, the pond, uh, uh, the pond players in the market. So, I, 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 you know, very biasly, of course, feel that we're 
we're blazing trails from this perspective. Uh, we've proven out the technology. Uh, in fact, in one of our buildings uh, in, in downtown Toronto that was built uh, originally in 2014 as a quote unquote smart building. And at the time, all that really meant is that all the systems sat on um, a, a, a traditional kind of copper active ethernet network. Uh, we swapped all that out uh, for PON and have recently stood it up and cut over all base building systems, uh, HVAC, uh, uh, lighting control, security, CCTV, access control, elevators, digital signage, uh, public Wi-Fi, you name it, uh, and it's working. Um, so I think that the market needs to see more of it working in real environments, uh, in different applications than just the, the kind of telco market that was traditionally uh, utilizing the technology to have more confidence in its in its capabilities. So um, I think that's kind of the big the big reason that we haven't seen the 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 amount of uptake that I thought we would when I was first uh, exposed to the tech. Uh, I think those are kind of the, the the big and major driving factors. And as more and more companies like ourselves uh, uh, successfully deploy the tech in uh, in in various different applications. And don't get me wrong, it's not without its hiccups. We we went through a, a bunch of challenges and, and configuration issues that we managed to work through and fix because they were new to, to all the folks involved, uh, but we fixed them and, and now we have have lessons learned moving forward. So, uh, so yeah, I don't know if there's, I mean, again, you're, I'm the wrong guy to ask from a technology perspective if there's a ton of negatives, but I can tell you it was a, a bit of a bumpy road, but we turned off a very traditional network in a million square feet of, of commercial building. Uh, we turned on and cut it over to uh, a pawn network and it works the same. And uh, the sites don't notice the difference. So to me, that's a win. That's great. And of course, you know, as you make that transition, Brian, you're, you're also seeing the, uh, the um, benefits on the energy consumption side, I imagine as well, right? Yeah, definitely. When we, I mean, we try to position people to understand DC power in general. So we try to focus on DC power because it is a much more efficient way to manage your energy consumption. Uh, traditionally speaking, when you look at most, the majority of AC powered devices, and you think those are external power supplies, like a power brick, uh, potentially a, maybe a wall war, or even an internal type PSU or converter, uh, where you would just plug in your power cord into the back box of something, let's say like your monitor or your TV at home. Uh, you traditionally see very low efficiencies from those types of devices. Uh, when you move into uh, a DC platform, you're going to be uh, at 90 plus, let's say efficiencies for majority of the manufacturers uh, that are building power supplies, rectifiers, DC to DC conversion, uh, versus those wall warts or those power bricks where you're really seeing an operating of 70% uh, efficiency. Now, in, in simple math, yeah, if you don't have a lot of devices, um, let's say in this case, like a passive optical LAN, um, yeah, if you're talking about maybe, you know, five or six endpoints, yes, that's not enormous savings, but when you look at some of the, the value behind passive optical land and some of these projects where you're seeing 500,000, you know, 2,000 ONTs, and you start looking at the potential of you know, improving your efficiency, your electrical conversion, your power conversion by 20% plus, you're seeing an enormous cost savings. And we're only talking about just on that utility side of the house, uh, your efficiency on the utility bill and the potential um, effects of being more of a green type solution, if you will. Yeah, well, I mean, you're speaking to the cost savings. Um, you know, Thano has, has really talked a lot about uh, it providing a key differentiator for uh, for Quadrail in, in uh, approaching the, um, uh, the, the industry in general. Julie, are you seeing, um, uh, you know, I know that you recently were published a report and acknowledged the fact that uh, actually Pascal Optical was one of the, I think, the three technologies that you saw is driving new demand in and around the overall passive optical network uh, market itself. Is that um, is that what you're saying? Yeah, and and I think it's it's really for for two reasons. One is that market education's always been tough in the POL space because you have vertical industries numerous vertical industries and 
CIOs don't or CTOs don't necessarily building facilities people don't necessarily talk to one to each other from different industries. So that makes market education. I don't have to tell the a lot of people on this uh, webinar that it just makes it much tougher. Second, you, you generally need a catalyst to change your layer zero. Um, you know, part of why, let's face it, part of why fiber to the home took off in certain geographic markets was because the copper network was in such bad shape they couldn't upgrade it. So they said, let's just go to, to fiber. And frankly, a reason which doesn't get advertised much is the copper was getting stolen um, because it is a it is a precious metal. So you need you also need a catalyst, and we we definitely have catalysts now. Whether it's smart energy initiatives, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's cloud-based applications, put them all together. So I'm seeing much more momentum now. Um, plus, we're finally getting to what I call a critical mass, where it's just it's better known. It's no longer oh well, it's just for a Department of Defense to the desktop, where it's really it's really well known. And I'll add a third that as you have people who have are on fiber at home, they get to a university campus or they get to the hospital, they get to a hotel and they don't understand why don't they have the great bandwidth that they have at home in their non-home setting. And we're seeing that also as a catalyst now that uh, employees are saying, you know, hmm, I have one gig at home, up and down, why don't I have that in, in my office? Right. Just an interesting question for you. I know that when you look at the PON market, you usually segment in between GPON and EPON technologies. One of the questions from the audience was whether or not uh, uh, you know, you're seeing, I, I know that most people on this call are actively deploying with GPON today as the foundation for that. Are you seeing any, uh, any demand for EPON in the, uh, in the past? Sure. Article? So, area? But it, yes, but it, it, it's largely depends on the geography. So for example, some of the um, passive optical lands in China, in the areas that had that used EPON, such as Shanghai, they're using EPON for POL. But it it really depends on what's the best known among the vendors and the, the ecosystem. Um, there isn't, I would say today, there isn't a huge difference between EPON and GPON like there was 10, 15 years ago. It's a question of familiarity, what you know. Understood. Understood. Well, I think that I know that we're coming close to the end of the hour here. I wanted to make sure that we were uh, considered everyone's time. I'm sure everyone has to jump off the meetings and things <laughs> relatively soon. Um, I was uh, basically just going to uh, say, uh, may maybe I'll just close with you, Thano. I know that um, <clears throat> that uh, you have really identified passive optical as a differentiator. <clears throat> excuse me for for Quad Real. Um, is there anything you uh, any particular um, Thing you'd like to say about that in terms of what's actually allowed you to position yourself as unique in your industry versus uh, versus other providers? Yeah, I mean, I think, like I said, it's enabling a lot of things that would be very costly and uh, very difficult for us to deploy uh, without uh, without that layer of connectivity. And what it's also doing that I didn't get into much is allowing us to um, leverage additional services into the tenant spaces in the case of uh, in the case of a commercial office building, for example. So one of the major differentiators for us is not simply um, not simply providing an empty box for the tenants to to fill with all the things that they need to run their business, but leverage some of our connectivity uh, to to start to position our our uh, office space as as business in a box, if you will, um, that lets them spin up their services much more quickly, leveraging infrastructure that we already have in the building. So not only is it enabling a number of operational use cases and experiential use cases. Uh, we're also getting into some uh, integrating with our, our tenants enterprise uh, requirements and seeing if we can, uh, if by being in a quadrille building, uh, they have a, they have more connectivity and a better experience than they would in one of our competitors' buildings. Well, it's a great, great testimony to technology. Thank you. <clears throat> so well, with that, I know that we're at the uh, top of the hour. Why don't I go ahead and... Uh, and wrap this up. Uh, basically, this whole um, webinar itself was made possible through the Association for Passive Optical Land, which advocates on behalf of the global adoption of this technology overall. Um, it's uh, an, uh, an entity that uh, not only serves an educational capacity, but also uh, we is always looking for other members to help share their perspectives and be part of the uh, mix. This is a uh, snapshot of the different members that are, are active uh, 
in the um, in the organization at this point in time. If you do uh, want to join, I just go to applelandglobal.org, right? And uh, you can certainly get um, uh, find membership information there. And uh, we'd love to uh, have you be part of it and part of the team that's promoting this technology overall. Um, and with that, what I'd love to do is uh, thank you for your speakers. I want to have a special call out for Brian Hansen for uh, for uh, coming, uh, basically delivering a, uh, well, he didn't deliver the baby, but it was close. He had an <laughs> active role in making it happen here um, and, and uh, joining us today and, and ensuring that uh, his uh, the perspective of, of uh, Enersis was heard and, and um, his uh, his views were all very valuable. Julie, as always, uh, wonderful uh, speaking with you. Thank you. And, uh, your market perspectives. Thano, I just love the perspective of uh, of Quadral and and uh, you're very articulate in terms of the uh, the value of of Pon and how it's actually uh, created a great differentiator for your industry. So thank you very much for attending. And uh, Francois, thanks for the um, uh, for the. Uh, uh, technology introduction and Rich, thank you for sharing your perspectives and uh, some of your customers' points of view. So, um, thank you. Any, uh, with that, I think I will close things up and uh, you can see the contact information if you need to get a hold of any of these people down at the bottom of this slide. I'll leave it right there and uh, hopefully we'll see you and um, uh, at our next webinar for uh, passive optimal, uh, in passive optimal land is uh, 102. It'll be in the September 23rd at uh, the same general time frame. Uh, we'll be sending out some information and, and registration links soon. Thank you very much for attending today and uh, look forward to talking in the future. Thank Thanks you, Jeff. Most of it. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, everybody. Bye.